Hold on just a second. Hello, hello. Greetings, chat. Can everybody hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Hold on a second. It takes a minute because there's a delay between the stream and the chat. Hey guys, if you can hear me, will you put a one in the chat, please? There we go. Hey, JD. We're going to give everyone a couple minutes to come in. But in the meantime, you guys, I have Jennifer and Joan. I have Jennifer from the Facebook group, Natalie Jones. Her story is not over. And then Joan is Elaine, Natalie's mother's sister-in-law. So Natalie's aunt. Um, Christy was going to join today and she was unable to. And Lori was, so she was supposed to join. Um, unfortunately, she's had a death in her family. And we just wanted to send out our thoughts and prayers to her. Hey, Tammy. Jennifer and Joan, are you guys there? I'm here, but I can't see any messages. You may have to pull up a second device. Can you go over to your tab? Do you have tabs on your phone where it says comments? Underneath the screen where uh, it shows. Yes, sweetie. I see it. I see there it. It's go. chat. I found it. Yeah. Now, you'll be able to read them, but you won't be able to type anything in. At least I can't from my end. I always have to do it on a second device. Hey, Rachel, Angela. We have some new faces in here. I think some are from the Facebook group. Guys, I just want to welcome you guys to my channel. I think we've lost Jennifer. There she is. Hold on just a second. Let me pull her in. Jennifer, can you hear us? I do. I was just trying to read back on chat. There's Elaine. Right. She's joining us in chat, you guys. That's yeah, Natalie's she's mom. In, she's on Trent's phone. There's a lot of new names in here. I was just trying to give everyone a couple minutes to come in. Sure. Sure. I think when we lost you, Jennifer, I was explaining to them that Christy and Lori weren't going to be able to join today. Yeah, it's unfortunate. Miss Lori lost a family member and Christy injured herself at church today. So. I know I hate to hear that. Yeah. Christy, I hope that you're feeling better soon. And Lori, again, our thoughts and prayers go out to you. There's a couple people from the group in here now. That's awesome. 
Welcome team, we're excited you're here. I'm gonna grab something real quick. Hold on just a second. So I have something I, I just want to read real quick, and it is someone that is pretty well known in the community who is a good friend of mine, who was, it was coming up on the anniversary of her brother's murder while I was working on the documentary. And so, you know, she was a real support to me throughout this, but, you know, unknowingly, I guess I was sort of a support to her as well. And she had sent me a message one night <clears throat> and she said that, you know, the anniversary was coming up, which is around the same time as the anniversary of, of when Natalie went missing. And she said that another year comes and goes. I think I've lost someone. Hold on. I'm back. She, she said, Another year comes and goes, and still time doesn't change how I feel. Acceptance is the hardest thing I've ever had to endure with this. They say that time heals, but it doesn't. You just have to learn how to live with it. Even after all this time, nothing changes but the years. The anniversary is coming, <clears throat> but it's just another year without, you know, the her loved one. She said, but I'm so grateful that she got to love him. And I just thought that that was, you know, it, it really resonated with me because Natalie's case, as I said in the documentary, that <clears throat> I don't know, it really hit home with myself and my kids and my husband, you know, the day that we went to the store and first saw her missing poster on the door. And my son, one of them is now 13, but when he was younger, Natalie's oldest son and my little boy, they played t-ball together. So after, uh, after hearing of her story, I immediately recognized her son, but I, I did not remember meeting Natalie. Um, and so I don't, it, it was sort of a family thing. They knew that I had been researching this case and, my husband doesn't ordinarily get involved in the cases that I research, but he, he too, you know, was involved in this. We drove the routes. We, you know, he was as active as he could be. I was as proactive as I could be. And then um, meeting you, Jennifer, it was just, like I said, it was one of those come together moments where you realize there's a reason that, people are pulled together and that was for a greater purpose. And if it helps to keep Natalie's case in the public eye, then, you know, I want to do my part on what I can to help with this so that Natalie's boys and her mother and her loved ones can get closure with this, you know, get some answers and hopefully provide justice for Natalie. Yeah, I totally agree with you there. It hit home for a lot of people near and far. And I think, you know, for us outsiders that are not in those communities and neighboring communities, it's also, you know, I mean, I was working from home during the pandemic and I saw the case on the news and for me personally, I was just baffled how a hot pink car goes missing in 2021. I mean, it just made zero sense to me. And um, having family in that area, I know that area pretty well, Heard County anyways. And, you know, it just, it baffled me that the case, how, well, first of all, how the case was handled, but then also just that we are in a digital age and this is something I have emphasized since day one. And um, 
they should have acted very quickly with getting um, the tower data. And I mean, get collecting all of the data from those towers. You can then just, you know, get, um, you can pull phone numbers of anyone that's connected to that tower and work backwards. And so it was, it was just really a great mystery, the whole case. And I think in the very beginning, um, you just kind of saw it as, okay, well, is, is she still alive? Did she run away? Did she, um, is, is her car in a chop shop? Is it hidden? Is it, you know, all of these different things. And trust me, there were a hundred thousand conspiracy theories that were going on online. And a lot of them in some of the early groups were, in my opinion, a tad on the dramatic scale. It became less about Natalie and more about them, which is a bit egocentric for my taste. But, um, you know, it, it, we were all, and especially the people from those areas, they were driving around, they were riding around, they were walking on foot. They know those roads. They know those um, pig trails. They know the woods. They know all of that. And it was just, uh, it was heated, you know, it was, it was very heated that the, I mean, a hot pink car that's, I still don't, I can't get over that to this day, a hot pink car just vanishes, but really, um, herd County is just one of those bubbles where it's rural, you know, and you don't have CCTV like you would in Atlanta suburbs or any other larger city. Um, or even, you know, most cities nowadays, they have CCTV at every traffic light. Um, so it was just mind boggling. I mean, it was the great mystery of 2020, in my opinion. If you drive up to Heard County, I'm not from there. Um, this is Joan, uh, Elaine's sister-in-law. Um, if you drive into Heard County, um, especially the way that I did, of course, through um, old highway back roads down Highway 16 into that way. There really is nothing. Um, it's woods and it's highway. And occasionally you run up on a little store, but that does not happen very often. Um, we originally pulled in there through the backwoods coming in because we had a designated area that we had originally decided to grid off. This was two weeks, uh, a little over two weeks into when she was missing. And we just so happened to start on Roosterville Road, um, right up the street. Uh, we met as a group, uh, there were five of us in a parking lot of Salem Church. Um, people from the area know that church. Um, and then we we drove up and down and marked the addresses that we had already been investigating. And then we started hitting all the pig trails and all the different places um, to let you know how out there it is i mean um i'm literally walking down pig trails and you come across a cornfield or you think it's a cornfield it's not a cornfield it's a round patch of corn and um, you look around a little bit and there's the deer stand um i climbed in quite a few of those because from the top of the deer stand you can see for a good ways we did have to be very careful. We were informed um, to be careful because we did not know what we were going to run up on, not just illegal deer baiting or um, there were things we could run up on, pot fields, um, moonshine stills, or even um, we were warned about meth labs. Uh, we were told very carefully to watch where we were going in the woods but um we we searched for hours and never seen any other human beings whatsoever and that was just from the thesis tower where natalie's 
property that she bought happens to be right across, almost across the street from, um, seven miles down the road to where she was found. And that whole area, there was no pink car. And I'll stand by that anywhere, anytime. You know, and actually, I have a video. Um, it's not as large as I'd like it to be. But when sometimes when you stream from StreamYards, I don't know what their default aspect ratio is. But I just wanted to show it. It's only a couple minutes long. And it'll show you um, Jared's perspective from Adventures of Purpose from the roadside before he ever went four strides up the hill. Um, and someone had left a comment stating that it was only seen because the bush hogger had come in, but the bush hogger had not bush hogged the entire field. He had only taken a couple swipes and at which point came across Natalie's car. So to say that um, she wasn't seen because he had bush hogged the field, that's inaccurate. And I'm going to go ahead and play this. So like I said, it's, it's just a couple minutes. Um, Hopefully, everybody will be able to see it. Hopefully, it's not too small. Let me go ahead and push that. You guys have been able to um, spot the car in there? You can see it? I, I can confirm, but see that thing right through there? No. Come where I am? Okay. In between those two trees? Oh, that's up there? Yeah. That's where they're at? I, I, I can't. And they have it covered? No, it's not covered. You can see the top of the car. It looks kind of pink, too. Well, if we just walk up there a little bit more, and then you can see it up there. Yeah, I was thinking walking in there because then you get higher. Well, let's walk up there a little bit here and see. So we're, we're trying to get eyes on the uh, scene for you guys. Right in. Right in there. Oh, they are. there it is. Pink car right there, guys. 100%. There it is. That is the first official scene and sighting. Natalie's car. Mom has confirmed it. I think PD is getting a little nervous. They're coming across the road again. Sir. Yes, sir. Can you please go back down the hill, sir? Absolutely. There it is. That is the first official scene and sighting. Natalie's car. Mom has confirmed it. That is the first official scene and sighting. Natalie's car. Mom has confirmed it. So, Joan, you were saying that you had actually gotten out, right? And walked that area, you walked up Welcome Road. Is that right? Um, yeah, yes. Uh, we walked up Welcome Road. We parked 
right there. Um, the only reason we didn't pull all the way up in there, but we had two vehicles um, any further than right there where the road was, was because it was it was muddy. Um, there wasn't a chain up or any kind of a rope, but we could see that it was, and we started walking. But like I said, um, I walked all the way to the pond. There's a, there's a, like a little pond lake kind of deal back there. Um, and I had walked that far, but like I said, um, we were warned. Um, I did take it very carefully as far as where we went to poking around because I didn't want to be, I mean, we didn't see any people. We didn't see anyone we could ask for permission. Um, and I didn't want to get shot. So, um, yeah, I mean, but then I didn't, I didn't see anything there. No. And believe you me, I'm, I find myself now still looking for a hot pink car and I know, I know we found it. So it, it's something that after you do for so many months, you, you look for it everywhere. I mean, I can only imagine the trauma involved in that and then continuing on with no closure and, you know, Lori, unfortunately wasn't able to join us today um but it's like she said in her interview that being from that area where she actively participated in the search for natalie the helicopters that came in i still don't understand why they didn't search the entire county I, i'm i'm baffled at that because you guys saw the state map and it's really not a large area at all. Yes, it's rural, but it's not a large area. And five miles of that is water. You know, so the fact that, I guess, let me find this right here. Um, Jennifer had sent this to me. There were a couple. One of the corrections I wanted to make was that I said in the documentary that um, the detective had got a ping on Natalie's phone in September and that was incorrect if from my understanding he received the rest of the phone records from um, Boost Mobile and that Natalie had last sent out her I guess the last message Jennifer can you explain that yeah to my understanding so just to clear this up for anyone Natalie got she had an iphone that she purchased and she got it from boost mobile during her time in alabama so she she made this purchase while she was in alabama boost mobile and other um kind of more i don't want to say low-end phones but you know just kind of the the metro pcs and the phones like that like straight talk they you know you've got your major carriers here you've got at t you've got verizon t-mobile so what boost mobile does is they use to my understanding they use um uh, like boost mobile natalie's phone use verizon the verizon network or the verizon tower so the records that uh the detective received were from verizon to my understanding but her her service was through Boost Mobile and she had an iPhone. And to my understanding, whenever he submitted the request for the phone records, um, I'm not sure as far as dates, but he received partial records. So if you think of it like this, you know, if you have a cell phone, you get your um, monthly summary, at, let's just say on the 30th. Um, of each month and that's when you're billed and you can see all of your your history from the previous month or if it's kind of mid-month cut off it just varies and depends so he only received partial records is what I was told and then in September he received the final portion now I'm not sure what those parameters were if it was from you know August 15th to September or whenever he got them but he received the last portion of records then, and it, it showed that her phone pinged from the location which she was found, but we don't know, was that in July? Was it in early August? Like when did her phone power down? When was that last 
signals, you know, when did it bounce off that tower? Um, and, and, and did they get the tower data? That is, that is really something that a lot of people have gone back and forth with is that why was, you know, was the tower data collected? Um, because that would have been crucial. This is all time sensitive stuff that should have been done very, very, very quickly. And I think part of the troubling thing with, with this case is that she was listed as runway for a couple of weeks and it may have been longer than two weeks. I'm sure Joan could jump in here, but those two weeks were crucial and collecting the data, getting those subpoenas or warrants out for phone records for, you know, sending it to Snapchat, sending it to WhatsApp, uh, text now, whatever. Um, that's why I emphasize very heavily that we are in 2021. I'm not trying to discredit manual legwork. Um, I fully support our brothers and sisters in blue, but if you're in above your head and you're not that technically proficient, you need to turn it over to someone who is. So, sorry, went off topic a little bit, but. No, well, you're fine. Actually, Christy, um, and by the way, you guys, Christy's the one that was, that participated in the documentary. Um, she's hurt her ankle and was unable to be on panel, but uh, she had said that it was in July. What what was in July? That, and I wanted to make now, sure I got this right. Now, uh, I went on July, I believe it, I want to say it was the 26th is when we did our search. Um. That I mean, that's when we went and did our search. Uh, now, uh, anything else in July, I'm not real sure about. Um, we were we had still had no clues, no anything. Right, and Elaine is saying Christy didn't Ellie say her last ping was September, but he didn't follow up on it and said it was a wild goose chase. I think everybody's in agreement that he did say that. Yes. Okay. Yes, now, I, now, what he told me, the exact words he told me were that he had gotten her phone records because that's the first thing I asked. I wanted to see the phone records, and I was informed that since the case was not closed, that he had the phone records over in front of him, um, and there was lots of highlights and blackouts and stuff, and I was not allowed to, I was allowed to see that it was phone records, but I was not allowed to see the phone records. And he told me that he had gotten her phone records and that he had gone over them. Um, and then he said that his his explanation was that it's one of those cases that you look at and then you go back over evidence and you go back over evidence. So it was like the second or third time that he had gone over this, he realized that there was missing phone records. So in September is when he realized that they were missing. Uh, so it may have been at the you know, and then that's when he was like, I need these phone records. So he went back to them and got the phone records. That is the words he told me in his office. And and when was that when you were in there? Do you remember? Uh, you're going to have to see. I have to pull up a calendar. Wasn't wasn't it back in like February or March? Yeah, I was going to say it was after the first of the year. I've had my husband has cancer, so um, we've been going through a lot here. But uh, yes, it was it's on my calendar in the house and I'm scared to go in the house. So I'll lose my signal. Um, That's OK. That's OK. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at my. I'm looking at my thing here to see if I have it written down on this thing. No, I don't. But no, it was it was after the first of the year. He actually contacted me. Um, we put it off. Uh, I was supposed to see him at the end of February, um, but we it ended up being like the middle of March before I actually was uh, some invest. It was around the same time another woman had come up missing in Erd County. And he didn't have time to deal with me because they were at that time uh, in the middle of that investigation. He didn't have time to I, deal with you. <laughs> that's exactly what was said. 
Um, I do not have to have time to handle this because we are really hot in the middle of this investigation and can't stop. And this was a woman that had been missing for like two weeks. It was around that time. And most people from Heard County, yeah, would remember, I guess, when that happened. I don't know. Yeah, that was a case of a woman that ended up being, I think she was from Alabama, if memory serves, and she, her body was disposed of in Heard County. Um, Heard County, I've, I've titled it as the Bermuda Triangle of the South. I mean, there's just all of these mysteries that happen in this county. It's, it's, it's mind boggling to me. You know, and back, back to, and you're right about that, but back to Christy's comment when her phone had last pinged, it, it blows my mind because, well, and, I, and I'm not going to get, I promise I'm not going to get into the cell towers again. I know some of you guys, you know, leave comment after comment and so many people are interested in that. And I feel like I've touched enough on it last time and this time that I don't want to drive anybody batty with it. But, you know, out there, I never could verify that that the tower in Ephesus was a Verizon tower. But there were three Verizon towers in the in the surrounding area. And the closest one, which you would think her phone would ping off of, was like six or six and a half miles away from where she was located. In this day and age, with or without CCTV, I'm, I feel like I just can't understand why they couldn't get that information. Why did it take him months to receive the phone bills from her phone company, you know, and like you said, there's higher end carriers and then there's a more affordable type carriers. Um, well, you've got is, to understand now they never took Elaine serious. I mean that you got to remember they didn't, it was at least shoot three weeks. That's why I was out searching because I mean, I had done gone completely through the internet and every single little thing. And I'm talking to Elaine every day and she's riding the roads and they're not doing anything. And she's got people riding the roads and she's sending me flyers and I'm putting them up out here. I mean, we had done got totally on the deal that we thought she had been snatched for drug trafficking or something, or, or, I mean, uh, for sex trafficking. So, right. I mean, we were I mean, just they- in total terror. Yeah. Um, they they did just have a sex trafficking bust one right. county over from us. So R- right, I, and I it's between my husband ours. And I were driving the back roads. We didn't participate with you guys in the active search, but we were driving, you know, the Alabama state line, and we were driving all the back roads. You know, meanwhile, I was checking out the towers and stopping by places like that, and the, it's it's like. Lori said, who I'm going to put her photo up here. She wasn't able to join us today, but um, she she was out actively participating. And uh, most of us around these areas are heavily back the blue. And I'm not talking about supporting those who profile and stereotype and all that, but just in general, that those that aren't involved in corruption and things of that nature. And so for for the people that were actively participating in these searches, having to go back and forth and back and forth with these officers, it it shouldn't have been that way. I mean, we're in small enough communities that if something like this were to happen, it, you know, you would, one thing that Lori said that I, I really thought was a great idea. And this came from someone who was in a different, was in Alabama. I think it was, was it, it was a, someone in a political role. I can't remember who it was, but the one who was the helicopter out. Sid Lockhart, I believe is, is who she said. And yeah, I was just about to jump in there. There, yep. there were, there, there's not only, you know, GSP, which is Georgia State Patrol, um, who f- quote unquote flew over the area. You've got, you know, Sid Lockhart, whomever he is, or they are, um, flying over the area and I'm sure a couple more I mean early on what I recall of the case is people were posting on Facebook that oh we just saw this plane hovering super low in in the area and it was always around Ephesus it was always around like the 
you know, Roosterville, Ephesus, Heard County area. And so the thing about that is, is, I mean, we can go back to these older groups and we can go back to these older screenshots and proof is in the pudding. We've got it, you know? And so we see that these local people have stated these things. They said that they saw it visibly from their own eyes. They, it was going on during the day. It was going on at night. And I just find it, I, I did a quick Photoshop illustration once in the group where I, I, I plopped in a hot pink car in the spot where she was found. And now Joan can go into further detail about like how much when she saw you know, the photos of, of how many weeds and stuff were actually growing up to the car. Um, my point was that pink is opposite on the color wheel from green. I mean, it stands out like a sore thumb, especially Excellent. for, a you? you know, especially for a helicopter that's not going to be like a commercial airliner that's at X amount of feet. Um, they would be able to spot that had it been uncovered and visible. I mean, it would stick out like a sore thumb. Um, and you know, Jennifer, I'm, well, I'm five foot two and I was out there the very next day. And, and so from where Jared was standing, I could see over the initial, there was this initial wall of kudzu and weeds. I could see over that. So, and we're talking 93 days. 93 days it's not a week or even a day or two 93 days and so we had minimal rainfall last year especially in those months the growth was nowhere near what it is this year it just blows my mind it's it, it's pretty baffling to think about and you know one of the biggest things where people get very heated in a lot of these Facebook groups is, was the car there the whole time? Was it later put there? Was it, you know, um, dropped off or hidden in a storage facility or in a U-Haul or a barn? I mean, we know that Natalie's car fit in a U-Haul and it was transported well, one, to Alabama that way. <laughs> yeah. Well, one thing that Lori um, was able to point out, um, I wish she could have been here, and it's a map that um, Jennifer uh, actually sent me. Um, that I didn't realize the airport in Heard County um, is not far. Is I mean, it's directly south. If you pull it up on the thing, there's a little airport, and it is directly south of where her car was found. It goes up over the police station. It goes, I mean, straight to where she, over welcome, if you were to fly straight north, you would have had to, I mean, you're not going to tell me no airplanes, no hell, nothing came out of that airport and flew straight over where her car was supposed to be and did not see a hot pink car. I mean, there's, there's just, I mean, like I said, I had to train myself in the last few months not to look for a hot pink car. I'm reading back on some of these comments. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I, I just. And, and then. The, had, oh, go ahead. The point, I mean, it was, that was one of the first things Boswell showed me. Um, uh, he showed me the crime scene. Uh, that's the first thing I asked to see. He had them laid out. They were crime scene photos. They were photos of her car. Um, it was the back of her car because her front of her car was nosed into the weeds. The back of her car, the top of her car was totally visible. Okay? That's right. Not like you something, could see it from not, the roadside. That's right. It was not like you had pulled kudzu off of it. Yes, there were weeds growing up. They were growing halfway up the mirror. They were blooming. There are yellow flowers. There are white flowers. Um, there is... Uh, it's just grass. It's like like field grass is what my husband calls it. Okay, it's only growing halfway up on the window. It is not over covering the car. I am not going to say that that car wasn't sitting there um, or sitting somewhere, but as far as being covered with kudzu and it got uncovered, no, there's no way. There's no way, and I don't understand 
how Lieutenant Boswell could look me in the eye, and me and him did agree to disagree, um, and tell me that, you know, it was there. That's all there was to it. It was there, and you know, I'm I don't agree with you, and that it was no foul play. Yet her watch was missing. Her um, phone is missing. Um, her windows were rolled up in 80, 90 degree weather. Um, her car was cut off, so no air conditioner was on. Um, there's just so much. If, if this was an active drug area, why is there drugs laying openly on the seat? Um, no one found and there was her. Gas. No one's... Right. Yes, there, there was, was gas in the there car. There was almost. Oh, did we lose her? I think, yeah, I think, Joan, Hello? I think you're kind of dipping out. Yeah, Joan, we're kind of losing you a little. Jennifer, um, Rachel, while Joan's trying to work her Wi-Fi out, Rachel had a question. Um, she sure. was asking if there was a house on the property. I didn't think there was, but I couldn't remember. But you did speak to the owner's wife, didn't you? I, I did, actually. Um, she made it abundantly clear that she wants justice for Natalie as well. And a few things that I can disclose from that conversation is is that um, the, the, the bush hogger was hired that day. Her husband had, I believe, had a heart attack or surgery um, and was hired to come out and clear the land that day. Otherwise, the husband would have done it. They do not live on the property. They have a few properties in the area and off that road, um, but they live about an hour away in a, another community. And so the bush hogger can't, comes out and he's up on a, I believe it's a tractor or something, um, and is starting to clear the brush. He comes across Natalie's car and stops and goes down to a convenience store and phones the police. So um, now, as far as was he allowed to continue to clear the brush, um, that I'm unsure of. The one thing that I find fascinating is because I'm very data driven, I'm evidence driven. You can go to Heard County Tax Assessor and pull up the pictometry from various seasons. You can go on Google Earth and you can pull up historical data from various seasons. And it doesn't look like that property, even in the summer, has ever been grown up to the point where you couldn't, you know, um, walk through it without hesitation. And so it poses an interesting question, which is, you know, if for one, if that place were, were such a party spot, and this is something that I've gone back and forth with quite often, um, I've spoken personally to about 10 people that are from that area that live very close in proximity to that area. These people would know if a part, if a spot is a party spot. Um, some of them have been in the drug world, you know, remaining anonymous. Some of them are as clean cut religious as you can get. And none of them have ever heard of that spot being a party spot. So my question is, is that no matter when the car got there, if it were a party spot and knowing that Natalie's car was turned off with gas still in the tank, it clearly did not sit there with it powered on and run out of gas. There was gas in the car. The trunk was popped two inches. Um, the car was turned off. Windshield wipers were on, visor down. You know, there was close to what is considered an eight ball of methamphetamines in the passenger seat. If that were such a party spot, okay, you know, so let's just say, why wouldn't someone see that if they had gone out there to do drugs or to get intimate or whatever, you know, 
kids or young ones or, or rebellious people are going out there to do. That is a pitch black area. It is not street, you know, there's no street lights. Um, so if people were going out there to do drugs or to party or to drink and all of this stuff, why did no one see her car? They clearly would have seen her car if they pulled back there. They, you know, and if they were that of that much of, of druggies, so to speak, um, there was a huge ball of meth or however meth is. I'm not, I have zero knowledge really about meth, but if there was that much meth, don't you think someone might've been like high when they went out there and they were like, Ooh, I can get this for free. I just need to bust out the window or I just need to open the door and they would have taken it or someone would have had a guilty conscience and maybe sped away. And a day later or two days later, anonymously contacted law enforcement. It's just weird. I'm sorry. It's, it's just, I find it so hard to believe that that is, that that was Natalie. And I can tell you this much. I'm, I'm just going to speak to, to Natalie and what I've gotten to know from seeing her journals and seeing, and uh, seeing all of this amount, all of the mounds of evidence that I've seen. Natalie was what I would call, she's a Southern girl and she's a bit of a tomboy. She's crafty and she can weld, but she's still a girly girl. And Natalie could have gone to a home if she wanted to go partake in drugs. She could have gone to anybody's home on a holiday. I do not. She could have gone home to her own home. The children right. and mother were not there. And that wasn't but seven miles, ten miles in the direction. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, and it, just, it was a, about four miles. And, you know, the thing is, is that the fact that her personal belongings were missing. To me, in my opinion, the first thing I would think of is that Foul that play. was someone that was wanting. Well, we all know the true crime followers that people take trophies or things to remember them by. And if it is somebody that was close to Natalie or attached to her or even jealous of her. Those are things that I would think someone would take because if it were about a robbery or money, they certainly would not have left a bag of methamphetamines and then just taken the other things, you know, that doesn't make sense. Exactly. Exactly. And there were, there were, (laughs) and we don't, we don't know if they fingerprinted the bag, the drug bag, do we? As far as, as I far know, as I know, um, yeah, the drugs were tested, but the bag wasn't. The drugs were tested, but the bag wasn't. <laughs> wow. Because I, I looked funny. Boswell dead in the eye and asked him, are you sure it was meth? Because, I mean, you know, uh, powder, it could have been coke, it could have been sugar. I mean, I said, are you sure it's meth? And his comment to me was, yes, it tested for methamphetamine. And she was, oh, the amphetamine that showed up in her system could have been the monster that was sitting in her cup holder that she was drinking. Say that last part again, Jane. The the amphetamine that showed up in her system could have come from the energy drink that she was drinking that was in the cup holder of her car. Well, her drug screen was negative and that the quantity not sufficient was that they didn't have exactly. enough of the specimen right. left over to test for amphetamines. But even so, amphetamine and caffeine are, aren't the same, but amphetamines would have just fallen into the category of ADHD meds or appetite suppressant. Right, right. But that, like I said, the appetite suppressant are those uh, energy drinks, the monsters, the uh, Red Bulls, the, but yes, he told me she was drinking um, an energy drink because that was what was in the car. That's what he found. A dollar bill, the bag, her, and um, if you'll notice if where you pulled up and ran the video a while ago of of Durham that that is actually Durham from the GBI on the passenger. I mean, on the driver's side of the car and what he is doing is using a lock pick to pick down and like they, the slide thing 
to slide in to get into the car because the car with was no locked. PPE. With no PPE, yeah, with, might I with add, no other PPE. than gloves. <laughs> and we're in a pandemic. Right. You should clearly have exactly. on a mask. Nitro gloves, not sterile gloves, nitro gloves. Right, gloves like you put your hair dye on with. Right. I. There was something I was going to say, and I forgot what it was, but uh, hold on, it'll come back to me. And that to me as well, you know, I'm glad that we have photographic and video evidence of that because there's no disputing that. And it just goes back to my philosophy and my, I'm analytical. Show me the proof. Well, there's your proof. There is no way that they should have been up on that crime scene without masks. They should have had a hazmat suit on, in my opinion. I have gone back over publications from the FBI, which should have been brought into this case from from day one, in my opinion, um, because it did cross into multiple state lines. And exactly, they, they're oh, they, I, 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 I agree. But yeah, I mean, they, there is just the handling of this case. And again, I fully support law enforcement. I have many law enforcement friends. I, I, I just, it, it, it just, there, there's something to say about humility where if you don't have, if you don't have the ball or the bull by the horns, let someone who is qualified to process these things. And the fact that, you know, the fact that the detective said, I pulled Natalie's car out. He should have not touched her at all. That should have been the coroner, period, or medical examiner. And her body going to the, the GBI, yet her car goes to her county. Um, I'm just like, what? what is going on out there? I mean, it really baffles me. And I can't emphasize that enough. I mean, I I, f- I fully support law enforcement, but this is just, this is weird and it needs to be looked into. Well, I was told that uh, Alabama um, cooperated 100% fully. Um, there were air searches, there were water searches, the house was searched, the property was searched. Um, they did take into, they took it serious, is what I was told, and they were very cooperative. Um, Elaine will have to uh, back up whether they were cooperative with her or not. But I know that uh, they were as far as uh, they were in their state. It became it became a supposedly by them. And like I said, they they all Georgia treated it like it was nothing at least for at least three weeks. Well, and. And, and that's something I can kind of dovetail into, Joan, is that when I, when I got, I would say, emotionally attached to Natalie is really after I met Elaine. Um, Christy came up to Georgia and spent a week with Elaine because Elaine needed help. She needed to be heard. And Christy, being former law enforcement, you know, she said, well, <laughs> I'm on my way up. So she came up and we had a similar situation like like Ginger Ninja did with Elaine where it was a lunch uh, a lunch setting and I looked Elaine in, in dead square in the eye because there was like a 5% chance because there were so many conspiracy theories and uh, things going on I I I can read people very well and I just wanted to look to look Elaine dead square in the eyes and see what my read was off of her. And I can tell you that Elaine, bless her heart, you know, as they say in the South, she has herself gone through unspeakable things. Um, Amen. But, Amen. But that is, that is a woman who has done the best that she can. And she, you know, losing her son yes, to has. the you know, losing her son to the hit and run, that's devastating enough for any parent. It was and then, horrible. you know, and, and then on top of that, here comes Natalie. And Natalie was imperfectly perfect, as I like to say. Um, people have gone out and, and really, you know, 
discredited her or saying like, oh, she was reckless and she was doing this and she was doing that. But what I can tell you about what I've gotten to know of Natalie is, gosh, she had such ambition and, you know, she, she did what she had to do to get by and she, but she was so ambitious. I mean, I, I myself, had I gone through half of what she has, I'm not sure I would be, uh, I'm not sure I'd be alive, to be honest. She was a warrior. And I mean, she was a ball of sunshine and a little spitfire from (laughs) the minute she was able to start getting down out of your lap. Um, She was, she's always been a joy, always. Um, you knew she was going somewhere. Um, she never, she never, I mean, even, even as a little girl, um, if I wanted to know what the kids were doing and what was going on, um, she wasn't ratting. She just wasn't lying. If you wanted to know, you asked (laughs) Natalie. I mean, it's like, well, we was doing this. Like, you know, what's wrong with that? (laughs) (laughs) She was always, it was, yeah, it's it's been really hard on my kids. It's been, yeah. It's been tough, I'm sure. But, but, you know, that, that's just what, and I talked about this a little bit in the documentary that people there are outsiders who who don't know much about this case. And then you've got people that are in some of the various Facebook groups that know a little bit, or they think they know more than they actually know. Um, uh But uh, they haven't seen all of this evidence that we have. And Natalie, I mean, she was a ball of sunshine. I mean, she, she would get knocked down and she would have her depressed moments. And she was like, you know, I just, uh, I want to get married one more time or, I might be homeless right now, but she got right back up. And I emphasize that in the documentary. Her mama was the, her mom is an amazing example of that. And Elaine has showed her, you can get it. You can fight it. We can do this, baby. We can make it. You can overcome it. Yeah. You can overcome it. God, she was enrolled in college. That's right. God will show us the way. Yeah. Absolutely. And uh, going back to that lunch meeting, just really quickly, you know, Elaine, and I I think this is really important for people to hear, especially for those that are in other various Facebook groups that have attacked Elaine um, about certain things, and perhaps Joan as well. Um, Elaine is everything but everything that you've said. She is one of the most, when I met her that day, she was very humble, very kind. Um, She asked for nothing. And I took her a a few gifts because she needed, she needed something to, she needed some spa stuff. You know, she needed a, I did a little custom printed photo of Natalie and gave it to her. And, you know, she's just been drugged through the mud anywhere from law enforcement not listening to her they wanted to deal with other people or people just tearing the whole family apart on Facebook and it's part for for the viewers that are not from the south I'll I'll just go as far as to say the south this is the south it's very gossipy and very everyone's in everyone's business and um, I just felt it really important and I, I can speak to or on behalf of of um, Christy and Lori and Kayla and um, Tom and anyone else that has been such an advocate um, and Kathy Marshall and the other admins of, of other groups that you know it you have to you have to show these people dignity. I mean, Elaine just lost last year um, her her baby. Natalie was her baby and. Natalie was trying to pave a way for her and her boys and her mom too. She wanted to take care of her mom. And one thing that I think is really important for those of you that actually care to do your due diligence and research here is if you go and find any of the three Facebook profiles for Natalie, go through and look through all of her photos. All you're going to see on there. 98% of the content you're going to see on there is her, her boys, her mama, and then her friends and, uh, and, and, and so on. 
that's it. And, and, and that just shows that, you know, they were all that they had in this world other than the grandsons, which, which, you know, held them all together. And I just, I really felt it important to state that about Elaine. Um, she is, she's a sassy spitfire and honey, I wouldn't want to cross her either, but you know, she, she's a good woman and she, I just, I got the most purest read from her when I met her. Um, she's hurt. She's gone through a lot, but she is a good woman and she wants justice for her daughter. And so also for anyone else that has said, just let her rest in peace. Natalie's mother, until she tells us to stop, until she wants to stop, we will not stop. We're not going anywhere. We will not be silenced. Her mother is the one person that gets to tell whether or not she wants anything to stop. And she wants justice for her baby. And yes, for her grandchildren, you know, just answers and closure. I mean, the fact that they didn't offer an advocate, you know, from the victim's fund, it that blows my mind. And to, of course, you're going to have a mother that is angry. I myself would have probably been completely out of my mind. And I thought Elaine handled it exceptionally well. I would have been unhinged. And that's the truth of the matter. I would have been angry. I, I probably would have had a whole mix of emotions all at one time. You know, so to say that Elaine believed in theories online, well, if you don't have communication, that's exactly what happens. People will take these cases and, you know, they dig into them because at least someone feels like they're putting forth, you know, a, a good effort. I mean, at this point, it's sort of it comes across as they're just waiting on a tip. It doesn't come across as, you know, we're actively investigating this. We're doing this, this, this and this. It sort of mums the word, and I think that was clear when Jared and Sam had spoken to um, the lead detective, and he said, "You know, I'm not. I, I can't discuss the details of the case." Well, I don't think anyone was asking for a, the inside hand on that. I think everyone was just, you know, and not only that for them to dismiss Elaine, not even speak to her and go around her to find out why she's even contacting. Why do you think that Natalie's mother was contacting the sheriff's department? I think that's kind of obvious. Exactly. Yeah, I, I have to say I'm extremely disappointed in that and to know that they're from a small town and even larger towns don't treat their victims' families like this. And it's like what Christy said in the documentary, and I think needs to be echoed again, which is you took an oath to protect and serve. You work for the people of your community, whether you like them or not. And um, my issue with a lot of that is I don't care if you have this little protected bubble and this alpha male complex because it doesn't work like that in the real world. And that bubble can get popped at any minute. So they, they need to tread very carefully and show dignity to um, even difficult mothers or aunts or friends or, or, or whomever. It's, it's just a superiority complex, in my opinion. It's, well, I can do this and I can do you know, park the brakes and take a seat, really. It's not, it's just, it, it's, it's not the morally or ethically good thing to do. It's not the right thing to do. And um, I, I, that just kind of irks me. It irks me a tad. Um, and that's more reason of why the FBI or Department of Justice will soon be alerted about this. So we will no. take it as high as we, as we need to. Amen to that. Okay, I'm here. Um, 
She sucks. <laughs> I was listening. I, I did talk. <laughs> okay, I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and here Elaine is saying that the father of the youngest son has not let her see him in 10 weeks. And not to mention because she had two sons and they were two different fathers. Um, she was in long-term relationships. One was a marriage with them. And the oldest son is not getting to see the youngest brother. I mean, it's not getting to see his No, brother. the brothers haven't seen. Yeah, the brothers have not seen each other. Um, Elaine and the oldest um, son have not seen their little, the little one at all. And it's almost 11 weeks. It's really I mean, that, that's heartbreaking. And I believe in time, you know, he's going to grow to resent his father. I'm the mother of four kids. I know how they operate. And not being able to see his brother. He was four. And believe it or not, they have memories. A four-year-old oh, yes. will remember all of these, especially at such a traumatic time in his life. And to be oh, ripped yes. away from his comfort zone and everybody that he knows and loves. Oh, he loves his mom and his Nana. Oh, yes. It, it oh, really, yes. I, so he's not, not that's, the, that's what's getting. Well, I don't even know if Eric is intelligent enough to get him some kind of counseling because not did he lose his, his mama and he's not never going to see her again. What he's doing with, with, um, his big brother and, and his grandma, that's, that is his life. That's all he's ever known. I, I don't, yeah. I mean, isn't it, uh, to me, the logic. I'm sorry. Right. No, don't, don't apologize. Don't apologize. I mean, I, I know that we're not, I agree, we're not going to. You're There's breaking up. Broke up. You broke up I'm a little sorry. bit. Um, you know, well, you're kind of going uh, in and out a little. Yeah, it looks like clouds are trying to pull up here. We okay. can hear you now. Found... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes. And he, I know it's crazy because you're thinking about police t and everything mystery I've ever seen and every case I've ever seen. The very first thing is the question is who has the most to gain? So we're not just looking at it from the aspects of the just stuff Natalie know that she probably shouldn't have um, the dangers of people being jealous of her or or just not wanting her around to I mean that Monday after she came up missing they had a hear I mean I'm sorry not Monday Tuesday they had a hearing it was not even a week after she came up missing there was a custody hearing and he very nicely went down there and met with other family members and got them to file an extension until mommy was found. But also, Joan, now with that tumultuous custody battle, wasn't there a temporary restraining order put out on him? Yes, and that for, was domestic, for domestic violence and child endangerment. And if I could jump in here for a second. Um, Go right ahead, yes. honey. Go right ahead. I'm, I'm breathing. <laughs> um, we, you know, we have seen those documents as well that, that Natalie filed as soon as she, so for, for this to be from the outside, when Natalie left Georgia, she moved to Alabama um, on the Gulf on close to the water because she loved the beach. This was in early March of 2020. And as soon as she got there, um, she she went and filed for a uh, emergency um, protective order uh, for the for the youngest of her children, and she was getting them one at a time, and I think like one or two times together. Um, and she had planned on 
making a new life for both of them while she was out there. But what I also wanted to tell a lot of the outsider people, and I think this is really important, um, without getting into name calling, which I would so love to do, but I'm not going to do it. Um, I know, me too. Also, <laughs> it's not going to benefit anyone. I know, it's not. Gonna I know, I know, I know. Yes. I know. Um, you're right. I'm, I'm behaving. A lot, a, lot, <laughs> a lot of these people connect. So outsiders, I want you to pay attention to this. The, the one person of interest that she dated knows the baby's father, knows the other family member. Family member. Is, let's just say a family member. These people, right. and also they also are all connected to the old man that Natalie named in her private Slick group. Willie. Slick yeah, Willie. Slick we'll Willie. Call it. We'll, we'll, the one that Wanda. Natalie accused of allegedly being Allegedly. her sex offender, um, you guys, for those of you that are just joining us, go ahead, Jennifer. I just wanted to kind of. Yeah, yeah. This is all in, in allegedly an in, in opinion of, but. Uh, of Boswell informed me con- there were going to be charges on another I've situation. I've yet to I know. I haven't either, but <laughs> I will stand up in court and say he looked me dead in the eye and told me. Yes, he did. Yeah. Is this something that y'all can talk about? Because I, I don't know anything about it. I was just wondering yeah, if it, I if wasn't it told not to. But I mean, you know, fill us in. I, well, I'm just saying he just when I said something to him about, uh, you know, like uh, statute of limitations, that kind of thing, you know, because I was looking out for Elaine and what she could do, um, and all I, I was shut down right quick and told that. Um, Things were being handled and allegations had been made and something was supposed to be done. But like Jennifer says, I have yet to see anything progress from that statement. I I mean, you got to think. I don't know if he was just talking to me, just trying to get me to shut up or. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, so are you saying that they're looking at filing charges on him to do with this? that's what i was i was in I, no i don't know if it's to do with this or another case someone that's one right. of the other uh 50 wasn't it about 50 of them jennifer i, I know there. they were popping up out of the woodwork saying uh they, yeah, yeah me yeah yeah we yeah, had several this, of them yeah yeah there is you um, had several of them what several, several of them. send it Contact us through Messenger saying they knew what yeah. we were talking about. Oh. Happened to them. It happened to them that they were, that they, yes. they have kind of known this. And a lot of people have not spoken out about him. And for those viewers, like my background is more involved in human trafficking. And I am Okay, huge... so uh, let me just clarify this. Are y'all saying, to clarify this, are y'all saying that females are... Our victims are coming forward, speaking out against the person that was allegedly accused of running a sex trafficking ring. Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. I just want to make sure I was following you. Yes. And Uh, and, as with every. Go ahead, Jennifer. I was just going to say, and and what I was kind of talking about initially is that all of these characters intertwine. They all know each other. They yes. all are kind of in support of each other. There, There is a lot of overlap here, and yes. it's very concerning. Very concerning. Right. right. It's hard to separate what to follow and what not to follow, what to believe and what not to believe. Does that make any sense? Right, because you have both worlds of people who were drug trafficking and sex trafficking allegedly right. running together although we do know that some of it's true because they have been charged and although they have not been convicted it is upcoming and speaking of which um we know that jonathan was arrested on drug trafficking charges and while he was in there he allegedly took out a hit on a troop county sheriff's deputy as well as his ex-wife's boyfriend, which was also an ex of Natalie's. And just recently, I'm about to pull it up. He was supposed to go back to court for this. Jennifer, do you want to speak on this? Because I got that from your page. 
the courtroom confusion leads to rescheduling for a man accused of soliciting murder of a Troop County Sheriff's deputy. Do you want to explain what happened with that? Yeah, to, to my understanding is that the attorneys contacted the judge and said that they were not aware that they needed to be present. Um, now, mind you, JL or the defendant was, is, he's temporarily being held in a neighboring county, um, which is also within the jurisdiction of the political incorporator on his business. That's his jurisdiction. Um, That's right. And I wanted to show <laughs> that photo, but there was a copyright on it and he had supposedly been beaten up while in jail. And so they moved him to correct. Fayette County. And that's correct. the county that Jennifer's referring to. That's correct. That's correct. And he's, I believe still in being held in that County. And um, so basically they rescheduled that, that court appearance. Um, they, they made a huge blunder. And what we believe is that they caught word that we had filed the petition. Um, this petition that was started, Kayla, unfortunately, was is not able to be on today, but um, she started this petition um, along with the whole community of followers and supporters to ask a grand jury to be impaneled to investigate um, Jonathan as well as, and keyword here, as well as anyone else that may have had a part in this alleged crime, if there is a crime. And um, it sat there and it just collected more signatures and more signatures. By the time that we decided to submit it, it had already gathered 4,200 signatures. And so we knew that it was time to get this signed, sealed, and delivered, so to speak. And, and I apologize, I didn't upload a photo of that, but the link for that will be in the description after we're finished, as well as the link for the GoFundMe, and Jennifer can talk more about that too later. Yeah, absolutely. But it was it was filed with the court. Um, it, we filed it with the DA's office, and this DA oversees multiple counties so what they call down there is is the tri-county area so it's it's various counties so it was hand delivered to his offices and then we also hand delivered it um to the circuit court judge to for them to consider impaneling a grand jury because we feel that that is necessary at this point and um, we had a great response after that was delivered. It was it was good to see action actually happening because the one thing about Natalie's case is after she vanished, even after her car and body were found, there's just been so much online drama and so much talk and no action. And so we made it sure that we were going to be the group to actually get things done. We are going to do these things. We're not just going to sit there and talk about it and let this fade away. We will, you know, we'll, we'll take this to the circuit court judge and the DA and, and whomever else that we need to take it to. We, we mean business. And so. That's right. And you guys have been extremely proactive and following through and not just making empty promises. Um, I think that Elaine was right when she said that she felt blessed to have you all in her lives, but in her life, because you guys have really been a huge support system for her. And she did tell me that. Yeah, there, there have been times, I think for those of us, like, Lori, Christy, and myself, and, and others for that matter, that have been following the case since day one. Um, it's one thing to, to be from the area. It's another to be an outsider peering in. Um, but, you know, th there were definitely times where, and I will note that there are a lot of vultures that are connected to a lot of these parties, um, even connected to the political uh, incorporator of, of JL and such, there there are a lot of people that have tried to muddy the waters through their words and gaslighting people into thinking, oh, it was this or oh, it was that. No, I'm sorry. We 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 can confirm what is and what isn't through many things that that they're not privy to, and um, 
there have been other admins on other groups. One of them pointed out body language of a few people on the scene that the day that Natalie's car was found. Um, that was incredibly insightful in my opinion. And um, it, it's just, we, we're, we're really taking the time to be there for Elaine and show people that Natalie was not just just a person. She's not another statistic. She matters. Her story matters. I mean, in my opinion, it blows, and I, I say this often, it blows any Jillian Flynn novel out of the water. It is so complex. It's a layer, I mean, layers and layers of spider webs, but you've got this young woman who came from nothing that knew her worth and made it as best she could, you know, and kind of Aaron Brockovich in a way and um, she, million dollar baby it kind of that's what that's what I think about often when I when I think about Natalie but gosh I mean she deserves justice her family deserves to know what happened to her and anyone sinister involved needs to needs to answer to that it, 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 they mean, should I, not I'm, get away scot-free I'm the aunt I love Natalie. It's killing me not knowing. You can, you've got to multiply by trillion to go, to go even what Elaine and the boys are going through. I mean, this worries me every day. Elaine never has a resting moment. Never. It's always on her mind. She'll never have closure till she knows what happened. That's right. That's right. And this is, she told, I mean, Joan, she told us verbatim. She told Christy and myself verbatim in person that this is what she's doing. And, and, oh, somebody's dropping dishes. Um, but it, it, uh, Sorry, that was me. <laughs> I'm trying to find a pickup space and a space to stay charged. <laughs> You, but, but YouTube burns a battery. <laughs> <laughs> it does indeed. Um, but, but Elaine, this is, she has not, and the, her family, Natalie's family as well, like they have not truly gotten to go through the, the process for closure because there is still so no. much unknown. And I guarantee you if, if, if the lead detective wants that has her hair, um, wants to go send that off, which we heard would cost around two, two K that if it comes back with, with any drug, then that's how it's going to try to be closed. Why is it supposed to cost any damn thing? Excuse me. I was told. Is that not part of the investigation? One would think. One would think. I found it really odd to be honest. What was that? I missed what Joan said. Uh, the fact that the lead detective has her hair and it has yet to be tested. Maybe you can uh, speak more to that. Well, I, I honestly, when Christy said that, I was just floored because, as I said, the top two most common labs in the nation not only not only offer that, but they offer drug abuse history. And toxicity as well. But the more time that goes by, the the less accurate the results will be. Exactly. You know, and, and even though we have the primary drugs ruled out, all these other little, you know, derivatives, side derivatives of these drugs are going to be that much more difficult, you know, if they're even able to run or analyze the samples i, I don't understand that i, I really don't it's like time think, time is the enemy yeah time uh, well, in this situation time is <laughs> yeah I, it's almost like a convenient thing that happens that's right and, yeah and that's exactly why you know and the people my suspicion my subscribers know that I've never um, spoken about a GoFundMe on this channel, but this is one that I feel so strongly about. And 
I don't receive any portions of that whatsoever. That goes directly to um, an attorney. And Jennifer, do you want to speak on what that's about too? And I'll grab the link while you're talking about it. Yeah, absolutely. Happy to. So um, we well, created I don't a GoFundMe. I, I was just gonna, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I was just going <laughs> to add that it it's of importance because they're only going to, the GBI will only hang on to um, the samples that they took, okay, that are going to, that are able to be analyzed for up to a year. After that, it's going to be destroyed. So if you, if you want to take it from there now, yeah. you can go ahead. So, so we, um, first of all, for you outsiders, there was a bit of a drama that happened with a family member. Um, there were two GoFundMe set up originally by, one was by the, the a couple family members. Um, and then another one was set up the day that Natalie's car was found with Adventures with Purpose on scene. Um, there was a whole big online fiasco of where's the money going. There were cash donations that were collected from businesses. There were, there was merchandise sold. There was all this like, where is that money and where is it going to? And so I think a lot of people that had donated are hesitant to donate again. Um, and they wanted, you know, from inside the circle, they, they just, they were kind of already like, okay, I donated 50 bucks last time. I don't know where that went. So um, it may have gone to her funeral or it may have gone to something else. I don't know. And, and, and to be fair, a lot of that was accounted for from the, the second GoFundMe, the first one and the cash donations. I'd like to see some receipts personally, but that's just my opinion. Um, and what we decided to do with this is we, again, being an action-based group, Elaine needed help. And so I was like, let's get together. We all come from various backgrounds. We found an attorney that said, uh, yeah, I will take on the case. I will go right down Heard County. I will, <laughs> I am not afraid of them. I've dealt with them in the past. Um, and so we conferred with counsel who set a legal strategy and what we believe separate from the grand jury side, which is really to get a conviction, really to, to get more evidence that we don't have access to, but what we do have access to is digital forensics. We have access to a former FBI turned private investigator. We do have access to things that um, counsel can go in with a strong arm and say, uh, yeah, we are doing this. Yeah, we are doing that. And that is something that we felt, me personally, I'm super tech savvy. I felt that was needed as soon as possible. Natalie had an Apple iPhone. All of that data, there are digital footprints somewhere in there. Um, I'd like to see who has tried to log into her account. I'd like to see, we'd like to see, you know, the IP addresses. We would like to see um, the history. Has any of it been erased? I mean, all of this stuff can be collected and the forensic team that we would be able to retain can get into all of that. And I think that would start showing a lot more about what was going on in recent weeks and days that led up to her disappearance. Um, and it's just really important, 100% of all of the donations, whether it be a dollar, you know, $2, 50, 100, whatever, they're going to counsel to these forensic experts um, they will not be spent on anything else. It is not going to one person. It is going to them. And this is strictly to get justice and to dig into these things. Um, if, I mean, I hate to be graphic here, but Elaine has gone so far to say, if we need to zoom a body, if we're confident we can get something, she is prepared to do so. Um, that's how much she wants justice for her baby. I mean, that is something... It, me as a mother, I would do the exact same thing. Um, you you want justice. And so unfortunately, with these cases, it costs a lot of money to do this. Um, 
attorneys are not free. <laughs> Forensic experts are not free. Um, and so we, it's kind of a two part thing. Yes, the grand jury is separate from that, but, but we really greatly appreciate all of our members and those that have donated so far to the GoFundMe, but that's really the biggest piece of where we're at now. We need, unfortunately, more money so that we are able to get all of these services and, um, you know, get, get some more boots on the ground, um, you know, uh, just to really dig in super deep and look at these digital footprints because i guarantee you we could we could see if anyone was successful into getting into any of her accounts there's ip addresses that are left behind um you have to be really 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 smart to get around that and oftentimes people still get sloppy so um i'm such a big advocate for digital forensics that um that's that's such a big piece of it. So we would greatly appreciate if any of you feel moved to donate. If not, if you could just share it, um, anything like that is appreciated. But um, we haven't set a, a, a time frame of when we would just close that off. But I do want to just go on record and say that if we do not have enough to to um, go with these services, then we're going to refund every. 100% of all donations. We hope it doesn't come to that. And we hope people feel moved enough to donate, but um, we're not just going to ride on. And they, to they have been 100% transparent. They, they will show any records, receipts, anything like that. And Jennifer told me not, she just said it publicly, but in private as well, that should it come to them not being able to raise enough funds that they would you know, it would only be right to refund that money um, to the donors. But sharing, sharing her story, sharing the links on your social media, her case is open and still ongoing. And we don't want them to close her case. We want to keep it open and keep Natalie's story out in the public's eye. Every little bit helps. Every little bit anything is greatly yes, appreciated and, and we do thank y'all very much yes yes we do yes we we thank each and every one of you we i think that the one thing i would say about our group members and just anyone that's been following the case uh to begin with is it, we've had this full circle moment where we've gone through the online drama with other groups and people making it more about them than natalie and we found our way to each other and we we have a small group and we keep that way for a reason because there are a lot of vultures out there. But at the same time, it is, it's really humbling. And I think it was the first time I got emotional was, it was a period of, I mean, a lot of us, we hold down full-time jobs. We have kids, we have families, we're trying to juggle this case and our, our normal lives. But the people that are in our group and some of the other groups, the admins on, on the other groups, we've just come together. It's not about us. It's about Natalie. It's always been about Natalie. And they have really lifted us up. And I don't think they've realized it. Um, they have lifted us up. And, and me personally, at times where I've sat there and just been like, I can't do this anymore. I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm there's nothing I, I'm getting nowhere, you know, or we're getting nowhere. And then someone will say something that just brings me right out of it. And I'm so grateful for every single person in this group. Um, we don't know each other. So we're, and we're, a lot of us are women. So we're kind of like, wow, it kind of cat by the, you know, or standoffish, but, um, I really just appreciate Well, no, it's that you guys have become like a family unit, just like, you know, our channels on YouTube, our regulars that follow along, you get to know one another. And the same with your, your Facebook group, you guys are a family unit and you're protective and rightly so. I mean, she, she and Joan and all of you, I mean, everyone's become friends all meeting in person and, you know, have become so protective. The family's been through enough hurt. It, it's time yeah, to get yeah, look, and not let these this case ladies, be Yeah, these ladies are amazing. Um, they've came into our family. And when you think about 
the stuff that Jennifer, that each one of them does on their on their own little time. When you take people like me and Elaine and and a couple of really close friends, and we go through and we have to dig through this stuff, and then we chase all these the just the crashes and the disappointments and the it, it tears you down. I mean, to the point to where, um, you know, for Elaine's health, we're like she's not going to give up, but there's just some, she needs a break. This is because it's it's a constant thing but you ladies stepped up and you have you've dug and 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 the things that you've discovered I'm so proud of because there's things there's there's just so much to all of this that just is in my brain because I've seen almost all of it and to have someone there to support and to help the family and to give us the um the strength and the courage to fight is one of the most amazing things when we really do love y'all and we really do appreciate y'all. You're more than we welcome. appreciate and that. And there's... Exactly. I mean, if it's the least that I can do to help get her story out there, it's like someone said in chat, you know, if, if this was your family, how would you feel? And, even sharing the story, you know, everything, every little bit helps. And I feel privileged to have been a part of this. And I, you know, it's not going to end here. There's additional information that we haven't put out there yet that we're working on for future, um, for future content so that we can continue on in this pursuit for justice. Jennifer, go ahead. I didn't mean to cut you off. Oh no, I was I was just kind of echoing that same sentiment. It's really been a blessing to to have this full circle moment because there were there was there was times where I would I would tell Lori like I'm I'm done. I'm going away and I go away for a week and then you you just get reeled right back into it because I mean just to to be fully transparent, I went through the ankle monitor report and I had a tab open for the tax assessor. I had Facebook open because you can, and that's a little tip for you people, um, you know, you can start to zero in on, okay, whose address is that? Why was he going here? Why was he then going there to this family member? Then why was he going to this uh, new flame of his? Um, we've put in our all. Um, we are emotionally invested in this. And no matter that outcome, we just want an answer and it, it, it's more heartbreaking for me to see Elaine and every time I've met her she's very upbeat um she, she you know she she you see her her sadness when she talks about Natalie but if, if that doesn't resonate with you I mean I question are you human because it, this is a girl that I wish I could just literally like do a two hour documentary on just the things that she's overcome and how she fell and she got right back up that I cannot emphasize that enough. She would get right back up. She was, you know, she got her land on June uh, 29th. Um, she got the warranty deed on her land. She was looking at getting horses. She had never ridden or, or not ridden a horse, but she had never owned horses. She was, so in, in, incredibly ambitious and that's something you typically see with city folk a little bit more you know people from urban areas she was very ambitious and she said you know what i might have been homeless for a minute or i might have been couch surfing or i may have had this depressed down moment where i didn't think anyone was ever going to love me again or or whatever but gosh that girl got right back up and i just I, I say that word or I say that phrase so much, but it's just, it's so important because it's so true. And it just, it reels you in. I mean, this could be a blockbuster movie in my opinion, but she, she was trying her best. That girl was trying her best. And unfortunately there are so many, what I feel on a personal level, 
dark clouds hovering around those areas. And um, if, if, it's, if it's okay, I'll, I'll jump into that just really quickly. I wanted to let outsiders know about these areas because they are good people that live in these areas. Um, again, it's Southern hospitality, it's Southern people. They are very connected, very protective. They are also very, um, just it's it's your typical small town and the neighboring other small towns and you have whether it's connected directly to natalie's case you have drug trafficking you have meth labs you have corruption you have human trafficking going on you have all of the gangs and that ties into all of it right because they're the ones out peddling drugs to other people and getting them addicted in these areas. And a lot of these people have began to, in these areas, they have began to normalize, oh, it's another OD. Oh, it's another um, gang-related killing. Oh, this girl that I went to high school with that was a, you know, honor um, student is now dating a gang banger. Um, they started to normalize these things that they think are is normal that is just not normal and they have family members that have become victims of this or maybe brought into drug trafficking or gang life or maybe they've OD'd or they're in jail this is really sad to me that they that it's just like forced upon them that they have began normalizing this stuff these are good people these are hard-working people these are rooted people in these communities and they want to feel proud of their communities whether they're um lower income middle income upper class there there's just something to be said about people from the south and i think it's really important to that people understand these communities and there's a lot of dark stuff that goes on in these communities that's very guarded and protected I'll say. Um, and I think what she's saying also is that, you know, a lot of, you know, regardless of what your socioeconomical status is, it it's moving in on everyone's territory, but more so in impoverished areas where. Well, see, here's the deal. Here's the deal. Like a, yeah, like they don't have a choice. They don't have many right. options. Okay, well, he Here's the deal that a lot of people do not realize, and especially when it comes down to the the sex trafficking or or however, in order to get your girls to go on the street to do things that some of us would never even think about doing, you can be high. You, you got to be not in your right mind. And that's where a lot of the, they use the drugs to control the women to get them. I mean, that's where the sex, that's a lot of the sex trafficking. I mean, they hook the girls on the, the, the little girls on the heroin. And we're talking about young girls, uh, five, six, seven years old. They don't care because once she, if she dies, they just toss her to the side and move on to another. What did we say, and Joan? It's all about that Natalie was realizing who she or how who she was involved with and was moving away from all of that. <clears throat> I mean, she she didn't go in eyes wide open on this. She might have been twenty seven, but she was I feel like probably naive in that she didn't recognize it. Whereas a lot of people don't because these people talk a good game. Oh, yeah, you don't. It's, you really don't. You don't have any idea. Uh, I mean, <sighs> they're slick. It's grooming. <laughs> yeah, it's grooming 101. The, these, the grooming, I, I can speak to human trafficking and sex trafficking. And a lot of there you victims, go. whether it be a predator that gets their hands on a girl or a boy for that matter, it makes no difference. The sex trafficking industry, I mean, people get sold left and right from all ethnicities, shapes, sizes, genders. Um, 
but the ages, one thing to note yeah. is ages, everything. And the one thing to note is is really just that grooming happens in a lot of different ways. It can, it's not always what you traditionally think of that someone was abducted and then they were just sold into sex trafficking. That does happen. But oftentimes grooming can start with violent threats, um, blackmail. Um, it can also be predators have a very keen eye for girls or children that come from underprivileged or broken homes. They can basically smell that them a mile away. Yeah, they they can they can sniff them out a mile away, and um, I it's just it's really sad to me that the especially you know with this alleged predator that it hasn't it hasn't fully been looked into more. Um, I really feel that Natalie was telling the truth in what she said because not only had she had she made a video on it, um, she wrote about it in her journals multiple times. And so for anyone to victim shame her, which I've seen online um, and say, this did not happen or this, you know, this, that, and the other, I'm like, well, well how are you connected to this man? <laughs> you know, how are, are you, are, it, it just, it, it boggles me that people would try to discredit her from her speaking her truth. And this is alleged, of course, but the pain that you hear when she made that video, um, her journals speak of this again, that were written in past years. It is heartbreaking. But when it comes down to it, what is what Joan and I have said, it's money, drugs, sex. It's a huge right. industry. It's a huge industry. And it all intertwines, just like some of the people in this case. It all overlaps, and they've all got their hands in a little bit of all of it. Some of them, not with all of them, but and, what I've and seen. And the bottom line, in my personal opinion, is baby girl learned too much about too much. Yes. And that's the only way I know to look at it. She saw things like, I mean, we're normal girls. We're we're doing this, we're living our life, but you notice things that people don't notice. Okay. Yeah. I used to say it, she didn't, I mean, look at the little, you know, and they got scared. Somebody got scared. Someone did. And they hurt Not, her baby because, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I agree. Jane, you're breaking up a little bit. I'm posting up a photo now and it was of communication that for whatever reason it didn't get sent out there's a little bit of delay between posting it hold on just a second I don't know if it's shown up I can yet see it. The, yeah I the see time it. on there was at 1 a.m in the morning and you know she sat at double bridges for 25 minutes after the phone call the four minute phone call There was a point to this and it just totally left me. I hate when that happens. <laughs> it, yeah. So. so for you outside viewers, this was an email that was drafted that was not sent. That Natalie had sent to someone saying, I hope you had a good four. She then sends a picture of her on the boat that she was on earlier that day. And as you can see, her sunglasses are clearly visible in that photo. Um, Per law enforcement, she pulled over at Double Bridges, which is the area that Ginger just flashed. And sorry, I went back to the photo. Oh, I'll it's go okay. Back to Double Bridges. It's, <laughs> it's okay. So she stopped at Double Bridges. So she makes her way back from Jackson's Gap and stops at this Double Bridges per law enforcement for twenty. Uh, yeah, for twenty-five minutes. For 25 minutes. And now it's also important to note that this double bridges is closer to her actual home than it is uh -huh, going yes. north, north to where her car was found. So allegedly she, I mean, she typed out, I would think that she typed out this email. It looks like the way that she writes her use as a, instead of Y-O-U, she writes you, I believe in this. So Hold on, let me get back to it. I think it does show that um, she has a distinct way of, of 
typing and writing things out. I, I did a lot of analysis to that. It does say you, right? Like you, the letter you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm yeah. trying to pull it back up. There's a yes, it is. It says hope. Yeah, hope the letter you had a good day or a good Fourth of July. Yeah. And that's how she used it. That's how she would text or write. She used the letter well, see, that, you. That's what makes me think that, you know, while she was out there, I, you know, if she was waiting on someone for that 25 minutes, you know, she would. Well, we know that she was talking to people on social media because the detective did say that he didn't elaborate on it. But he said she was talking to people on social media outside of that ping that went off. So this draft was at 1.33 in the morning when it was saved to draft. If I'm driving down the road at 1.33 in the morning in a dark, deserted area, then there's usually only two reasons I'm going to pull over. One is for the police, and two is for someone that's that's stranded and I've got to feel safe. Like I have to see a woman or a woman and a child. Or Or the fact that she was, you know, while she was in the middle of writing this message out, you know, she could have been waiting to meet someone or been attacked at double bridges. And it, you know, it went from there. The fact that she was writing this message to me stands out like a sore thumb. You know, at, we know that she had crossed the, the line and that she went to Double Bridges. Well, in that period of time, she made that four minute phone call. She was there for 25 minutes. After that phone call, why would you just hang out in a deserted place? And let me tell you, I've been out there. There are no street lights. It's completely pitch black, surrounded by the woods. Oh, it's all dark. The way around. It's scary. All the way around. Yeah. 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 And, you know, I don't know if she was waiting to meet someone or she was ma- waiting to meet someone there or if she was attacked there. But the fact that she was in this message and didn't hit the send button. And you all know that if you turn your phone off or put your phone down, your email, typically you have to shut your screen off for it to save to draft like that. It won't do it while you're just sitting there. And your screen is open. Mine will not go to drafts that way. It, it will go to drafts if I either a save it to drafts, which is really a lot of trouble, or you just close that screen out. Once you close it out, it will automatically save it to drafts. And then right. between that was at one thirty three, and her phone last pinged. What was it? Four forty five a.m. Somewhere it's like varying. Yeah, somewhere in that area. Yeah. You know, something that jumps out to me, though, is how how was that exact location able to be determined? Yet when they initially zeroed in on where her phone last pinged, that location was not able to be zeroed in on. But they were able exactly. to zero in on this. I never thought about that. Exactly. I mean, until you just said that, really, it didn't occur to me either. And... I, I still feel like that this right here is a major key in in this puzzle piece. I mean, like I said, just even growing up uh, out in farmland, I would not venture out and just go, just drive. I mean, I would drive to the store in the parking lot. I don't. To a desolate, desolate area and wait to meet anyone. And it was only yeah, approximately. I, I do not know. I do not know why they have not made a a literal virtual timeline of where she was and start from when she woke up on July the 3rd until she came up missing. Because just like um, her having um, her picking the kids up. All right. In order for mom to go to work, she picked up her nieces and nephews early in the morning. Um, okay. Then it was said that um, she was dropped off at like 5, 530, which according to Lieutenant Boswell, 
she dropped the children off. Oh, and according to the babysitter, um, they were dropped off a little after lunch. According to yeah. Boswell, she then went home to her house. And I don't know what she posted or where it was posted or why he is so adamantly definite that she was at her home from a little till after lunch till around 5, 530. And according to him, that's when she left her home. Now, whether she directly went straight to Jackson Gap or she made a couple of side stops where people say they saw her with so-and-so and stuff like that, I do not know. But he said that the babies were dropped off then and that she went home and she killed like three hours at home. Well, wait, though, which, because now that you bring this up, I have a mini clip here that I'd like for us to watch. And this is um, where Natalie had picked up a family members, uh, had picked up her family members, children had taken them to get their nails done. And this is the family member explaining. I know, I know what she states, but that, well, I'm that has been. The viewers know because that not everyone has seen this. Oh, so okay. I'm gonna, sorry, honey. I'm sorry. That, that's yeah. okay. I was just going to play this it's just a uh, it's not even a couple minutes long and then just let you pick back up so that they can kind of be brought up to speed right right um, so i'm gonna push this hold on just a second before going to alabama for july 4th she picked up her kids and spent the day with them getting their nails done and she dropped them off at her friend's house before heading out let's just take a look at the interview her did with April Ross from BTV talking with Natalie Jones family so when you saw Natalie um what was your conversation with Natalie um actually I was heading to work and she was coming to get um my two kids and she had spent the whole day with them while they work. she took my daughter to get her nails done and um then she had dropped them off and she they, they were with her all day and then she dropped them off that night around 5 30 at a friend of mine's house, and I didn't get off work until about 7. Till about 7. That's exactly what I'm referring to. I'm sorry for the background noise that the dogs were barking. I, I'm sorry that was hard to hear a little bit, I know, for, for whatever reason. Um, but then that is, at the end, that was the message where Christy had asked the detective um, exactly what time were they dropped off, and that was his response. So I find it interesting um, that you're saying this because I wanted you to elaborate more on all that. Um, well, I'm, I'm, not, um, I'm not sure if it's been sent to you. We have actually spoken to the lady that um, was babysitting, and from what I understand, I do believe um, she had been um, a little bit earlier than 3.30. Um, and like I said, according to Boswell, she killed like three, she, she killed some time, like up till, up till after five o'clock before she ever thought about going to the river or lake or little bit of Um, so like I said, it's it's really bothered me that no one can make a timeline. No one. And and we as a group have even tried. But it, it's very it's so very hard without her phone records, without those things, to put an exact timeline of what Natalie was doing and where she was at. Exactly. That's and, the and first just to that I'm, hearing about, I'm sorry, I was just gonna say that's the first that I'm hearing about that that the detectives was adamant that um that she was at home for all of that time. And then someone had stated, I think it was Christy, it may have been Lori that stated someone had seen Natalie with three guys on Highway 100 that afternoon before she left to go to Alabama. 
Now, I, I don't know if that is true or not, or if that was just someone that had posted that. Jennifer, do you know about that? Yeah, in the, in the beginning, there were a lot of people that said, oh, I just saw her the day before at Pops, which is this local convenience store slash gas station, um, or I saw her pumping gas around one o'clock, there was nobody else in the car, or we saw her car traveling down Highway 100. Um, that was, those were early screenshots that were captured. So um, it's been varying accounts. Different people have seen different things. And, and again, too, you know, it's, it's maybe they thought they saw her, maybe they did actually see her, but it, it's we, not been. We happy. actually. Yeah, we actually had a girl change her car. Her boyfriend painted her, her car purple because that's how many times she was stopped. She lives in Alabama. Um, and now, she uh, actually. That... Uh -huh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, I, I was just going to say that you said that she had a babysitter. Is that right? So yeah. she had her oldest one. At... I know oh. the youngest was with her dad for a I mean, with his dad for the 4th of July, but did she have a babysitter for her oldest son that night? No, the um, family member. She had the family member's children, and they had a babysitter that they were being dropped off at. Okay, I misunderstood. That's right. right. I know who that right. person is. In, per right. in reality, I know who that person is. Right. So, so she, um, backing up to, to some communication. So the woman that Natalie dropped the family member's kids off with stated that she dropped them off shortly after lunch. She had never met Natalie before and she dropped them off in Grantville, which is a city or town. I'm not sure if, it, if it's actually a city. Um, that's probably about 10 to 15 minutes from where Natalie lived. Now, um, also to note here, there was text communication that we have <laughs> screenshots, screenshots of that show Natalie texting the youngest ones of her children, the father's current girlfriend. And she had asked her, hey, did y'all find fireworks? Um, I found a place if you guys haven't found any to take. The youngest one and she said yeah we found him there in Carrollton we're gonna take him and she said okay cool um so that also kind of shapes up the fact that we know that Natalie had been invited to the lake a few days prior to her kind of confirming Natalie was not a very planned person she kind of had a bunch you know it's kind of like that young and free mentality of where it's like okay what's going on here what's going on there I might switch I might change my mind etc and we, we know that, that she knew that that offer was there, but she did not confirm that she was actually going to go to the lake house until the day of. And at that point, she messaged, that's when she messages the child's father's girlfriend. She's not corresponding with the father directly. And, you know, uh, assuming wakes up early in the morning goes and gets the family member's children, a boy and a girl, and they go and do things. And then she drops them off somewhere between lunch or noon to 3.30 per law enforcement, and then allegedly goes back home. And we know that she had a bikini with her. Um, she did not apparently change out into the bikini because she got there so late. Now, mind you, it is the the dog days of summer, as they call it in the South, and the sun sets anywhere, I think, between what, like 7.40 to 8 something, sometimes almost 9, it seems like. So Natalie did not get out to Alabama until way later in the afternoon. And to, to our understanding, she never changed out and got like fully in her bikini. She had the clothes that she was wearing while she was there. And so... It's just really interesting to me because there's also the fact that, well, it's not the fact, but from what we've heard about the uh, mother's child left their cell phone in Natalie's car. That puzzles me very greatly because now, I mean, anyone with a kid that's been brought up in the generation of technology 
safety, if they lose their phone, if they forget it, they're going to be going haywire because they're constantly on their phone. I think most of us are constantly on our phone. It's the way they engineer it. Um, yeah, the kids, the kids really lose it when they yeah, misplace their phone. It's like, I can't play my game. I got to find my Pokemon or I got to find, you know, do this or that. So if that is true, if that is actually a fact, I would be very curious if that phone had been tracked, um, if there's any records that could come out of that phone, was it investigated? Was it looked into? Yeah, that's a great um, point. That's a great you know, point. Uh, I'm sorry, I missed the point. What did you say, sweetie? I'm sorry, I lost this for a second. <laughs> I was just talking about um, the, that the, the child's phone had possibly been recovered that was lost in Natalie's. The, the, the child's car. phone was recovered and it was returned to uh, the family member. Um, and it why was not the phone? But not she was that saying I am it wasn't tracked because usually by default, those things are turned on. So unless the child's That's parent it, turned that off, you know, was the child's phone tracked? Well, even if that is dead, aren't they supposed to still be able to be tracked? They should have taken that phone in for evidence, in my yes, opinion. Yes, they should have. You're absolutely right. I, because I, I, now, see, that they did have the phone in for evidence. Now, when they gave it back to her, I do not know. I cannot answer that. I don't know if there is anyone that can answer that. Even if it wasn't on by I default, do. I have my children's locations turned on, and that would be I interesting. Understand. I understand. I have, yeah. Yeah, I understand. That, I mean, part of the school system, that's the way, that's part of why children have cell phones at school now is because it's basically tracking devices for parents. Um, I mean, and I totally get it. Um, all mine are grown. Um, but even some of my grown kids, um, like I have my mom, back. she's an older lady, and it's just to keep up, you know, to make sure grandma's okay. So, yeah, I do not know, though. I cannot testify. Whether a uh, little man's phone was gone through or not, all I know was that I personally picked up a phone that we had given them um, with Elaine's permission and um, also because they threatened to lock us up, um, which is an old phone that she got before she got the new phone that she started using in March. And that is the phone that is missing. Right, the newer, That's the, the newer iPhone. Yeah. Right, the, the the right the nice iPhone. Yes. Yeah. But I mean, just, like I said, those are turned on by default. You have to go in and switch that setting off. So, and I mean, what parent would go in and and switch their kid's location off? I'm not saying she did or didn't. I, I'm just saying I'm I'm thinking I out really, loud. Honestly. It seems like I remember seeing him um, sometime. Um, I'm not very familiar with her children. Um, I really don't know how old he is. Um, I don't know if there was actually service on the phone or if he was just like an eight-year-old with a phone well, to play games on. Do you see what I'm saying? But the thing is, is with those phones, they have to have Wi-Fi in order to yeah. utilize them if they're not hooked. Right, I know, know because, because right, my grandkids have asked, yeah, they've asked me to turn my Wi-Fi on before so they could use it. And right, and on, on top of that, on top of that, they also have to, and this is a key thing too, is that they have to be logged into the Google Play Store or the App Store to download any of these games or apps. And so that's a big piece of it too, as it as it relates to Natalie's phone specifically, is that she was potentially logged into not only Apple iCloud, but to her Gmail accounts and to any other accounts that a lot of these, and what a, a lot of normal people don't realize is that these, um, your GPS, whether you're using Google Maps, Apple Maps, et cetera. Oh, that stuff tracks they, everything. It, it yeah. tracks everything. It does everything. unless you turn yes. it off. And, and that's what I'm saying. I don't. I doubt that that child's phone was turned off. I just can't imagine a parent going in and switching the location off on your child's phone. I don't phone. even know how to. I don't know how to do that myself. Okay, and I'm 50. 
<laughs> yeah. I'm older than that, but we'll leave it at that. But, see, that's just one <laughs> of many questions that that would be interesting to know the answer to. And if there were better communication, you know, no, it would. I'm telling you. I don't know how he talked to, and I will say the Jones side of the family, and we'll leave it that at that. Um, but personally, sitting down and speaking with me, he had on a very polite face. He was never loud. He was never rude. Um, he was very specific in what he laid out to me. Um, he pretty much uh, gave me answers. Um, I could tell by the look on his face several times that I surprised him that I knew certain things. Um, but when I would go into questioning him, um, I got a lot of shoulder shrudging. I got a lot of we don't know. And um, as far as they're looking at the case as no foul play. But we still have all these unanswered. I don't care if the car was parked right there and there's blood in the dirt, okay? The bottom line is baby's gone and nobody can tell us who did it. Something conspired in her county, as Lori said. Something happened and the answers are still out there. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. there's no two ways about that. I just, like I said, and I, the only thing I could say was, in my opinion, because I'm not an actual medical doctor, but the fact that they were unable to perform certain things of natural causes for lack of the likelihood. You have to have knowledge. You got to have knowledge the, to know the, that. The lack of um Due to decomposition, the lack of organs and other things that they were able to analyze, whether it was linked to natural causes. Again, it still doesn't answer, though, why she was on at Double Bridges for 25 minutes, why that e that email went to drafts and was not sent. And then, you know, if that was at 1.33 a.m., her phone pinged. At approximately 4.45 a.m., what happened between 1.33 a.m. and 4.45 a.m.? Those are the exactly. that, those are the golden hours right there. And why would she, it, assuming, now just assuming, and I use air quotes, that she drove to that location. I, I'm telling you, I don't care. I, I'll debate it with anyone. Okay. I do not see Natalie going and driving into a dark cul-de-sac. She was fearful enough to go meet the baby's uh, father, that she would meet him in a public place, a public parking lot. She is not going to go there. And I just really do not see her driving into a wooded area. His sister with lives up the road. There's a lot of people that live up the road. It's, it's, there are it's, a lot of people that live up the road, but I mean, still, why not go to the house? Why would you drive to an open field like that? It just... He, he, I and, drove to his sister's. Uh, That's where he was. Jessica says, what if the son's phone was left purposely in the car so that Natalie could be tracked that night? You know, and very we try, for the most part on this channel, we, we try to stay away from theories and try to stick with the facts. But in the, the, the fact that we don't have that many facts to go by, the few things we do have. So... You know, input is good. And unless you're, you know, since we're not having communication from law enforcement to dispel these things, then I think what anybody brings to the table, it, you know, it, it opens up ideas of any possibilities. They're, they're valid concerns. I think, Jessica, you asked a really good question. Um, I'm per I personally have my own opinions about that, um, that. I will just say that, you know, to the DA Cranford or anyone else above certain people, if you're listening in, even FBI, we'd love to hear from you. Um, I, I, I'm hoping that they do the right thing and impanel a grand jury because all of that can come out. And the grand jury, even though it's done in secret and, and there's, it's not a, you know, 
it's not going to be broadcast on the front page of the news, nor do they have to really give a response to the public on what they're doing, if they're going to take the case or not. All of that, including any person other than JL, can be brought in to, to, you know, they can be interrogated or interviewed. They can look at phone records. They can get all of that data. So I'm just going to leave it there that I really hope that that happens and that it can dispel or prove certain things because it's we're in 2021. I mean, that is just exactly. The truth. And I understand that law enforcement is going to have cars that they're going to hold close to their chest for obvious reasons. But a lot of this stuff is sort of public knowledge and is out there because of social media and because things were shared so frequently by Natalie as well as others. But I wanted to point out that um, the same family member uh, said in an interview that, um, uh, let me think how she worded it. Uh, hold on and I'll just play this real quick. And and it's not very long. Hold on one second. It may, for some reason, the volume, Barely. even though I'm putting the volume up on that, it may be a little hard to hear, but here, I'll play this real quick. This was part of the interview um, that was done with April Ross on BTV. And her phone pinged her home um, later on that night. So the phone did ping her being near... Being near home, yes, on the way home. On the way home. Because mm -hmm. you have to go to Ephesus to, to get to that from where she went to the house. So that's where the phone had Thank you, Julie, for sharing. It's Thank you, Amos. Okay, so it was pinged on the way going home, mm -hmm. but it has not been located, the phone. Mm -hmm. So you don't go through Ephesus at all? At, at all. And I'll no. show you the map. Um, and actually, I was showing the map in that video. I don't know if I put it up or not. Here we go. So from the left is coming from Alabama. Uh, I had it in the video. This one might be a little, there we go. Um, so you can see down at the left was the party in Alabama to the yellow dot was her home. Now uh, the pink dot would be up towards, well, it was the location where Natalie was found. And above that would have been Ephesus. So you, you do not, that's not even a, an option on the routes you would have to literally drive around your elbow to get to your butt to go that way it's not something google's going to pull up for you so i don't know if that was just um they misspoke but i would think that someone from being from this area would know that i mean i'm i'm from this and area but yeah we we know for a fact that natalie had used gps to get out there. Yes. So she would have had to have used it to get back as well. And yep. none of the three routes, I did it, I did it via Google Maps, I did it via Apple Maps. None of those three routes would veer you up to that location at all. Either way, you could come maybe within 10 minutes of where she was found, but you would still have but to even travel so north. You, you would have minutes. to go way out of your way because I actually drove the route, my husband and I did. And you would literally have to go out of your way for that. You know, if there were detours, you could go that way, but you would have to know what you're doing because like I said, it's not going to pull it up on Google maps as an option. It's exactly. not, it's not going to pull up Roosterville road and have you go that way to come home. Um, and that was sort of puzzling as well as, for me, um, and again, I'm not insinuating or blaming or anything like that. I'm just speaking out loud that for me, I found it puzzling that um, they said to April Ross that they didn't speak to Natalie when she dropped the kids off because they were at work. And then... Well, she said she, she she did say that the last time that she talked to her was when she dropped the kids off at five thirty. Well, first then, she said no. She said I didn't know uh, when she said, "Did you talk to Natalie then?" And that would have been at five thirty. And she said no. And then a few sentences later, she said 
that she, the last time she had talked to Natalie was when she dropped the kids off at 530. So I was a little bit confused. And like I said, the only reason why I found it puzzling is because, um, and I, I'm going to pull this up. <clears throat> now, I had to black this out for, uh, because it's the address, but this is from the ankle monitoring report. And you guys, I'm sorry if this is blurry. Let me try to pull this one up. So what we have on the left um, is the date. And then, hold on, let me, I don't have my glasses on. Um, uh, on the left is the date and the end date. And then it has the duration, the amount of time that was spent. That very last one that circled was Jonathan visiting um, a family member. And it's the family member that had turned him in for the death threats. He was the there the one. day after Natalie went missing. Why would you go and visit the person who turned you in to law enforcement for putting out a, a hit on somebody? Uh, and it was also this person's brother that was offered the money. Of course, he didn't do it, obviously. Um, and she did the rightful thing. She turned him in. The family member did. But I was a bit confused. Why would he be going to visit her the day after Natalie went missing, knowing that he had placed a hit on Natalie's ex-boyfriend and also the Troop County Sheriff's deputy. I don't know if he had done that at the time yet or not, or was it the Sheriff deputy? Either way, they all go hand in hand. That's why it's difficult to separate each thing because it's all one big, like, mod pod. It's really, it's really strange to me that he goes from a known drug house, allegedly, to this person's home. And then he then goes even further south to West Point to visit his quote unquote girlfriend, his most recent flame, so to speak, after they became official as soon as Natalie vanished. And he spends, I think it was like 80 to 90 minutes there. So he basically goes... 30 minutes alleged drug house to 30 something minutes to this family member down and spends 80 to 90 minutes at this new flames house. It's a weird series of events because I can tell you this much. If my sister had gone through or a family member had gone through a pretty nasty relationship and if I knew her well, right. I'm not going to be associating with, with That's an, what it's I just, was gonna it, say. you just don't do certain things. You no, just don't like do I, that. He, he had bitten Natalie. He had tied her to a chair, locked her, allegedly locked right. her up, um, had, you know, done all of these things. You, there's no way, no way that I would be allowing this man over at my house. And, this was the day after Natalie had gone missing. Well, and again, I'm not insinuating anything. I, I'm just saying there's so many aspects of this case that are, you know, are, are I'm perplexed by them. Right. Let's exactly. And and another thing that I thought of the other night is why did why did Jonathan feel comfortable enough taking that death threat to that family member? That's really strange to me as well. Why well, what, would you? Yeah, I mean, he offered to pay her brother to. Okay, so Jonathan had had been uh, listed as a suspect in a criminal stalking trespass case on July sixth. Now we went missing on July fifth. Now I don't know if. Come to think of it, I don't know if it had been. He conveniently turned, turned himself in. But I'm saying I don't know if, if it had been. If uh, Tabith, I'm sorry, if the family member had um, yet turned it in to law enforcement because it was July 6th at that point. And um, I. If, Oh, uh -oh, hold on, Joan. I was trying to let you back in and I accidentally removed you. Hold on. I think we've lost her. I added you back in. No, but I I'm think in. I'm in. in. Okay. It says I'm I, in. I, Can you hear me? One thing, 
We yes. hear you. Can you hear One me? One thing I was going to, okay. we, we hear yeah. you. One thing I'm going to say really quickly is that what, if I'm not mistaken, and, and someone could definitely go, go behind me and fact check this, but if I'm not mistaken, the date that that happened where JL threatened, was driving by this ex. Now this ex is an ex that Natalie used to date that then ended up allegedly um, seeing Jonathan's ex-wife. Um, but this person is also the one that Natalie took a restraining order out on correct. in 2018. Now correct. this is the man that that had the supposed hit taken out on right. him by Jonathan, just to let everybody know. Correct. But this was, if I'm, if memory serves, this exact date that he bounces from the three places was the same date that's noted in the court transcript that he was writing by this person's and, and making threats. It was that day, that exact day, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Can you repeat the last thing you said? I, I didn't hear you. The very last part. I'm it's sorry. A lot. The last part, I was just saying that that if, if memory serves, that that is the date that he was making, that he had ridden by um, and made the made the threats to uh, or one of the many threats to this gentleman was that exact date on 7-6. So at that point, sometime during the day, he had ridden by his house and like shot him a bird or something like that. I th I'm pretty sure that that was 7-6. Right. But what I was saying was, is I couldn't figure out why the family member would allow him over to her house. But again, that was early on. So she may have not yet turned it into law enforcement in all fairness. Uh, I, you know, yeah. to be fair, I'm just saying it was. I don't know when she, I don't know when she turned it in to law enforcement, but since that was on maybe that was the day that all this went down and she decided I, I can't speak for her. Maybe she decided at that point she was going to turn it into law enforcement. Again, I'm just thinking out loud here. That's what we're all doing, honey. <laughs> Very so Foxy Brown, um, she says, didn't they say her phone last paying 4.3 miles South southeast of Ephesus Tower, they said that it last ping uh, four. I think it was four point four miles south southeast of Ephesus. Which, anyway, that is not where she was located. That was across the map from where she was located. Um, that's not even south southeast. If you, I showed the map of Heard County. Um, in the documentary and I'll, and, and I actually, I showed it even better in part one um, because 4.4 4 miles, I think it was uh, South Southeast would have been over towards um, a different road. And she was sort of um, a, a, almost a, across from that. She was actually in the, the act, she was located in a South Southeast direction of Ephesus, but where they said it pinged was in inaccurate. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Guys, uh, I have uh, to jump to out of business. Go ahead, Jennifer. Yes, I'm going to have to jump off. So I just wanted to formally say really quickly, I greatly appreciate all of our members tuning in and Elaine, we love you. Joan, we love you. Ginger, Nina, we love you. Thank you so much. Um, I'll let you and Joan kind of wrap it up from here, but we okay. greatly appreciate anyone that can donate to the GoFundMe. And thank you for just keeping Natalie's story alive. We appreciate all of you very much. And just know that we are fully prepared. We will go up as high as we need to go. We are not being silenced. We are not stopping until justice is served. Arlene tells us, calm it down. <laughs> um, and we will continue to fight for Natalie because she is worth it. And we want to make sure that she is not another statistic. And this case grows colder than it already is. Allegedly. Thank <laughs> well thank said. Very much. Well, thank you so much for joining us and this is not this is just the beginning of us collabing together on 
um, projects that we have upcoming. And, and again, we're going to continue to work on that. Jennifer, thank you for joining in. Thank you so much. I'll check in um, and watch the, the rest of the live. And thanks okay. to all of you guys for tuning in. Thank you very much. All right. Bye, Jennifer. <laughs> okay, bye. Christy says, don't forget Natalie and JL had words at that family member's house, too. No, I wasn't aware of that. Mm -hmm. Joan, do you know about that? Yes, that was the day. That was that day. If I'm not mistaken, the, the day she picked the kids up. Am I right, Christy? So they had... Either oh, that it was either right. the day it was either the third or the fourth. It was it was I think either it was the third. The fourth. I yeah, forgot about I that mean, because if yes, I'm not mistaken, because that's she... when that's when according to the family member, Natalie's words were you're not gonna get away with it this time. This time you're going down. And in two days, he turned himself in willingly. Did she he say that gone. on the text? Or is, where did you hear that at? Out of the family member's mouth. And he said what again? That you were going down? That she was going down? That he was going down this time. He wasn't going to get away with everything he says he gets away with. Yeah, because I have right here from the court transcripts where he's saying that he was innocent until proven I'm guilty. In the right. And he's he saying people with money me. don't go to jail. You're breaking up a little bit, Joan. I'm sorry, sweetheart. Uh, I can go outside now. I have actually um, enough percent. Let me see if I can get out there for I can hear you now. So he was saying basically in the court transcripts, well, according to the text messages that were in the court transcripts that it was planted and um, he's saying, watch these charges disappear. The person says, no, watch you go to prison. Yeah. He's like, nah, LOL. And then he says, people with money don't go to prison. He told her that. He told her that. I saw that. I saw that in in writing. Hit him, texting her. And so she was or was not a witness to his upcoming drug trafficking case. Do we know that for a fact? It has not been stated to us by Le. Not to me personally. Um, as far as I know, not to Elaine. Um. I mean, she was going into the witness protection program, anything like that. That was not discussed. Um, like I said, I don't know. I, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's kind of like you take a good girl um, who, who does everything she's supposed to, cooks for her family, takes care of everybody. She lived there. She noticed things ain't normal. Um, I mean, this is all, this is me just looking at, you know, speculation. She's trying to build a happy home and things aren't happy. Things are, things are weird. And she, she knows, she knows more than she should know. But he thought he was Superman. He thought he would never get in trouble. I mean, that's also something I know. I mean, it's also something that, that just, it all needs to be looked at. Everything crosses everything. Jennifer said it, and it, it's so true. It's so really mind blowing. That she wasn't down as an actual witness on that drug trafficking no. case, but right, the, she the, did know. The, I mean, she was privy to a lot, and she was exposed to nefarious people. We do know that. And, and she did, and she was trying to get away from it. Yes, right. she was running away. Yes. That's why she went to Christie's and hide. She was getting away from, she was, she didn't want him anywhere around her. He found her at Christie's. He I just, was, he showed, the police showed up there.
it's like Christy was saying, wonder if she was referring to killing someone. He had hurt, he had hut out. Sorry, I stepped outside. There's a lot of noise out here. He had a hut out. I'm not sure what that means. Remember, he claimed to have killed before. No clue if that was true. But according to Natalie, um, he had, you know, claimed that he had killed someone and that he was going to put them where he put the last bodies. But uh, I just this spending time on this case and researching. I mean, it there were days when, I mean, I, I spent sometimes upwards to 18 hours working on that documentary and being so deep in it, it just, my heart broke for all of you and for her because I could see her trying to find a way out. And every, it seems like everything she was doing, she just kept running into that. Yes, that and she was almost there. She was, she had bought, you know, she'd put the down payment on the land. She had enrolled in college, not just enrolled, but got accepted into two different colleges. She had that was part, that yeah, baby, she did. And part of why she had the protection things on her phone, part of why she swapped phone services and everything was to get away from him so he couldn't track her, so he couldn't find her. I don't care if he says he moved on. I don't, I, I'm, I'm just, I don't know. I need to be, we, you, I love you. Thank you, Ginger. You're awesome. This has been wonderful. <laughs> uh, I know. Go ahead, sweetheart. I mean, it, it's a lot, I know. And, but I agree with you. You know, you don't have to have it in words to kind of figure out or read between the lines. I mean, it, it was apparent that she was trying to get out. And we all know that the most dangerous times in a domestic abuse situation is when the one person that wants away leaves. That That is the number one most dangerous situation of all domestic abuse situations. And that's what she had done. So, and like I said, I, I'm not saying that I'm not saying anything. I'm just basically stating what what the actual facts were in the case. Well, see, the whole sad the sad thing with all the facts in the case, um, and the bottom line is everything that happened, the link, the ninety three days, like you stated in your in your documentary, um, the not being seen, the not being found. One person was not. There's more to this. We don't know exactly. We do know some things we're trying to puzzle in. There's so many people that are connected with each other that we don't understand why they were together, why they would even associate um one of our common links is Natalie. Um, like I said, the question is, is why, who, what did Natalie know that Natalie wasn't supposed to know and how many people are involved? And I don't right. care if it's just one or two people in her county or if it's all five counties from Alabama to, to the other side of Georgia. I'm, I'm sorry. That's just my opinion as a family member. And, um, you know, well, I mean, not only that, but, you know, n now they have changed the laws that being present when a crime is committed or even being involved and in knowing about it and not reporting it. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, you're just as guilty as the person that committed the crime. Amen. Yes, ma'am. Amen. Amen. Well, I guess we can wrap it up, but I will say this. This is not the end. And I know there's a couple things moving forward that um, Elaine, you know, wants to discuss. And I hope to further collab with um, with all of you guys on this and continue to keep her story in the public eye, again, all of these links will be posted in the description once this is finished processing onto YouTube. And um, 
So I guess just stay tuned until, yes, ma'am. until thank we you. get that info out. And Joan, it was a pleasure having you on. It was and a Elaine, pleasure. thank you. <clears throat> Christy, I hope your your ankle gets better. And again, Lori, you're you're in our Ice thoughts and, and prayers. Go ahead. No, I just said ice and heat. Oh, <laughs> and when you said Christy, I said ice and heat. <laughs> That's right. Right. Rest, ice and heat. That's it. Um, Stay off of it. Ice and heat. And again, uh, Elaine, you have so many people behind you and that will continue to support you and, you know, just will continue to pray and continue to pursue this until you have the answers that that are just for the rest of y'all um for the new people here and also from the group uh thank you so much all of you for joining in joan do you have anything you want to say or elaine christy do any of you have any last words joan did i lose you I think I lost her. Well, on that note, guys, thank you again. And I guess just keep an eye out. Uh, you know, I'll post anything that we're going to be doing in the community post. And and uh, we'll get together again real soon. Everybody enjoy the rest of your evening or morning, whichever it is. And thanks again for tuning in. Bye.